common mistake is to assume that Christianity is about a way of life, a moral system. But before all else, a Christian life is a certain kind of relationship with God through, with, and in Jesus Christ. Because we have that relationship, we try to live in a certain way. We know that we're loved by God and try to return that love by loving God and all those whom God loves. One characteristic of that relationship is that it is not ended by death. God's life-giving love is not overwhelmed by my sin and will not be overwhelmed by my death. The Sadducees were not non-believers. In some ways, they were more strict in their obedience to the Word of God than others, particularly the Pharisees. The Sadducees pointed out that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, believed to have been revealed by God to Moses, does not mention anything about life beyond death, let alone resurrection. For most of the history of the people of God between Moses and Jesus, there was no clear belief in an afterlife. Since the Israelites were surrounded by people like the Egyptians and various Mesopotamian cultures that seemed obsessed with death and its aftermath, this is unusual. Perhaps they had to avoid the issue in order to get their priorities right. The little speculation was vague and certainly did not include resurrection until fairly close to the time of Jesus. That gives us an important message. Faith is primarily about a relationship with God, not about getting to heaven or anything else that smacks of what's in it for me. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and the prophets were all people whose faith relied upon God's love for them and their love of God in return, not upon a hope of some form of life beyond death. The Sadducees who face Jesus are a canny bunch. They use a debating device called the reductio ad absurdum, taking their opponent's apparently sensible position and drawing it to a conclusion that shows it to be nonsense right from the start. They bait Jesus by asking about the case of a woman who married seven brothers. Well, extreme. It's not absolutely outside the realm of possibility. A widow was expected to marry her brother-in-law if she had not yet born any children to carry on her husband's line. The Sadducees want to know whose wife she will be in the resurrection, or if she would have a husband for each day of the week. They figured that they had shown how ridiculous belief in resurrection could be. Jesus refutes them by denying their premise, another debating device. He says they're wrong to presuppose that resurrection is experienced in terms of the life we know. Whatever resurrection means, it is not a rerun. Jesus goes on to use the Torah to show that resurrection is in line with the ancient faith. The voice that spoke to Moses from the burning bush was that of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But since God is God of, not of the dead, but of the living, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. Jesus affirms the resurrection of the dead, but he does not tell us what resurrection is like. He merely says it will not be like the life we know. There will, for example, be no marriage. But what will there be? He does not say. We use lots of images when we talk about resurrection. Halos, harps, clouds, a banquet. Jesus himself uses this one. We do that because we need images in order to think, pray, and preach about the resurrection. But we know nothing, and it appears we're not supposed to know anything. St. Paul has a rather strong answer for anyone who wonders, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? His abrupt but clear answer, fool. Apparently, we waste time when we speculate upon the resurrection. 
All we need know is that God loves us. In that love, we live in spite of sin and evil, and we'll live in spite of death. There are no human words or concepts to explain it. All we can confidently say is that it is far beyond what we can imagine or even hope. We're in for a big surprise.